news just in, woodworker Patrick Sullivan turns the woodworking world on its head by doing a video about end grain lustra. It's a great video. I highly encourage you to watch it. Before watching this, it's very important to have the context for what we're about to discuss here. Patrick's video is fantastic. And before I go any further, I want to be 100% clear. I don't disagree with a single thing in Patrick's video. I think his testing methods were fantastic. I love the scientific approach. The delivery of the information is great. Here's my problem how other people are interpreting what they saw in that video. Now, before we get into some of Patrick's results, the first thing we need to understand is what he was testing. He was testing glue bond strength in a couple different scenarios. He was not testing joinery strength in a sense of a mortise and tenon or dovetails or whatever it is. He was just looking at glue bond strength, making the point that the end grain glue bonds are stronger than we have been told they were. And I think he succeeded in that. Where it goes off the rails is when people start to compare those results to traditional joinery results and how strong joinery is and using it sort of as an excuse to say well I guess we don't have to do joinery anymore well don't throw away your dominoes just yet in this chart Patrick shows the amount of force that it took to break the joints using various woods the green blocks represent both side to side joints and end to side joints that's side to side like this and end to side like this. The end to side joints were only about 20% stronger. So both sets of results are packed into these green boxes. And I would say the average looks to be around 220 to 300 pounds of force. Now the gold boxes are the thing Patrick is trying to hammer home. These represent the end grain to end grain butt joints. These connections were two to three times stronger than the other glue ups. And I think Patrick did a pretty stellar job explaining why that is. And this is the point where I think people are getting a little bit lost because the increase in strength when you go end to end is not really all that relevant. I mean, if you're doing segmented turnings or picture frames, sure. But most of the time, if you're joining boards end to end like this, it's because you ran out of wood. You're probably better off just getting a longer board. The joint that we as furniture makers are much more interested in is the one that only comes in at 220 to 300 pounds of force and that's this sort of end grain to side grain connection. So are the results we're seeing here worth just throwing out everything that we know about the mortise and tenon joint? Hell no! You see these red boxes at the far end? Those are the values for how much force it took to simply break a board itself, completely fracturing the long grain. So imagine taking the board, bending it over your knee, and just breaking it. It takes a lot of force to do that. Now, when we create interlocking wood joinery, we're not really concerned about which glue surface is touching which other surface. I mean, we may talk about it a little bit, but the joint itself is where all the strength is coming from. Our goal is to have two pieces intersect in a way that takes advantage of the strength of both of these boards. The glue itself just becomes the thing that prevents it from being pulled apart. Now the glue can certainly add some strength to it, but the amount of strength added by the glue is just a drop in the bucket when compared to the actual strength, the mechanical strength of this joint when the two pieces interlock. And really what we're going for with wood joinery is not down here at the cheap seats. We want to be over here. That's the goal of interlocking wood joinery. And that's significantly stronger than the things we're seeing in these glue only numbers. Now, let me put my money where my mouth is here. Uh, back in 2009, Fine Woodworking did a fairly exhaustive joint strength test that I think is pretty good. And I think if you're a member, you could easily get that PDF. And I can't show it to you because it's, it's their stuff, but I can tell you some of the numbers that they achieved here. But I do want to add that it's hard to make a direct comparison because the way that Patrick broke joints is not exactly the same as the way that Fine Woodworking broke the joints. Um, but I will say that the way Fine Woodworking broke the joints is more appropriate for how furniture is typically used and the stresses that are typically applied to those joints. So I do have faith that they're numbers are very, very accurate. So let's take a look at some of these numbers. Uh, Fine Woodworking actually did a control as well, just a simple butt joint, and they rated that at 473 pounds to break it. Keep in mind, we have to consider it was a different testing mechanism, and the way that they broke the joint is a little bit different. So that number is a little bit higher than the numbers that Patrick saw. Fine Woodworking did this article in 2009, so why didn't woodworkers lose their mind at that time? Well, because that was one of the weakest things that you can do for joinery, right? Just the glue alone. We're focused on things so much higher than that that woodworkers were not exactly phased by a 473 pound break. So now what happens when we jump to a traditional mortise and tenon? Well, the number goes up to 988 pounds of force applied to break that joint. And if you take variations of this joint with reinforcement, you'll see results as high as 1,210 pounds. So these numbers are significantly higher than the glue joint numbers that we saw in Patrick's test. And let's put this in a real world scenario because very rarely when we build something, do we have a single joint just living on its own, doing its thing. Typically you have at least four 
if not more joints that make an entire thing. So it is sort of uh, something that you can multiply out and get an idea for how much this entire thing will be able to support. So if you remember, Patrick's numbers for end to side grain glue joints were in that 220 to 300 pound range. Now let's be generous for the sake of argument and just say that we can call that an average of 300 pounds. And when you multiply that over four joints, you get 1,200 pounds of total support. Now, if we use fine woodworking's butt joint number at 473, you multiply that out and we end up with 1,892 pounds of total support. And remember, you know, pieces of furniture, you're not really going to stress one joint. Uh, even if you have a picture frame and let's say you're putting pressure from corner to corner, all joints are going to spread that pressure across them, right? So that's why I'm doing this multiplication thing. Now let's look at the mortise and tenon. If we take the weakest version, being the simple classic mortise and tenon at 988 pounds, we'd have 3,952 pounds across four joints. So if you're making a door for yourself, let's just call it a four joint door for yourself or a client, uh, which would you rather go with? The one that's in that 1,200 to 1,800 pound range or the one that's nearly 4,000 pounds of total support? I think the answer is pretty obvious. So again, just to reiterate, the reason we're getting this extra strength is because we are taking the long grain of one board and pushing it into making it part of the other board. And in order to break those pieces apart, you certainly, again, depending on which way you apply the pressure, but if you're trying to break them apart this way, you not only have to break that glue joint, but you have to allow that tenon to move in the mortise. It has to be able to move or something has to give. And we're pitting a strong orientation of one board against the strong orientation of the other. And that joint becomes super strong and the glue just becomes somewhat secondary. So I implore you people, please do not throw away your dominoes, your pocket jigs, uh, you know, your bead locks. Uh, if you make traditional joinery, don't just stop doing that. This stuff still has value. And in fact, I think it adds a considerable amount of strength to the joints that we make. And I honestly think Patrick would agree with me on that. So other things to take into consideration. Well, what about wood movement? Over time, a joint experiences wood movement and it stresses the glue. So it can actually weaken the glue bond. So if you make a, let's say a picture frame with just glue on those miters, over time, the expansion and contraction can weaken those connections and you could have a problem, which is why we use splines to reinforce them. Again, adding long grain strength across a somewhat weak joint. The other thing is sheer stress on the joints from usage, whether you're talking about a cabinet door, a chair, how about this, a chair that you lean back on. It's one of the worst things you could do to a chair, but the joints have to be able to withstand that pressure. And as the pieces flex and move, when you do that, you are stressing the glue bond. And if it's only a glue bond, that joint will break way sooner than something with interlocking joinery. So what does all the data from Patrick's video actually tell us? Well, I think in terms of like actionable things, not very much. I don't think anyone is gonna be changing what they do as a result of this information. Uh, one thing I would say that I'll do a little bit differently is when I describe the gluing of a mortise and tenon joint, passing down information that was told to me, I often just say, don't worry about getting glue on like the outside shoulder of the tenon because that's end grain and it's gonna meet the face grain. It's not gonna add much strength. In reality, it's not adding much compared to the strength that the regular part of the joint is providing you, but it is kind of icing on the cake. And if that joint is stronger than we thought it was, why the heck not? Just put a little extra glue. You got a little cleanup to do, but it could make the joint just that much stronger. And one of the things that I think impressed people the most is when they saw that end grain to end grain break, they were very impressed with how much pressure it took and that it was stronger uh, than the other orientation. But let's put this into more of a real life situation. The actual amount of pounds of force to break that joint really isn't that high. And it actually, for a human being who is gonna make use of leverage, it's actually a whole lot easier to break when the pieces are longer. Patrick's pieces were very, very short. Good luck breaking that with your bare hands. Let me show you how easy it is to do when you actually have a piece with project parts that are pretty close to what you might use in a real project. Here's a piece that I glued a couple days ago because I kind of thought this might happen. Um, let's see if I could break it with my bare hands and my knee. It definitely took some force, but I'm a human being and I'm not the strongest human being out there. Uh, if that were a piece that actually had, let's say a loose mortise and tenon joint or something connecting those two pieces, I don't think I would have been able to break it as easily. So while we can definitely say the glue joint is stronger than we thought, is it still strong enough for anything practical? Uh, that's gonna be up to you and the kind of work that you're doing. Now this whole thing does bring up a really good question and that is where did this myth come from? Why do woodworkers always say that the end grain glue bonds are weak. I think 
That's the answer. If a woodworker is just trying all different things and just seeing what works, and eventually they, they try to glue two pieces together like this, when it breaks, they see it's a clean break. And Patrick goes into a lot of detail about why it breaks clean. Um, but the fact that they see the clean break is telling to them. They think, okay, well, that must have been weak. And when they glue the pieces together like this and a break occurs, it's the wood that splits and not the glue joint. So I think the automatic assumption is that was stronger. But what Patrick proved is that if you actually look at the numbers, it's not stronger, it's actually weaker. It's just that the grain has less strength in that orientation with that pressure applied. So let me just repeat here that I agree with everything Patrick did and said in his video. I think it's great, you need to go watch it. You should have watched it already, but it doesn't really change a whole lot in terms of actionable information. But education is education and information is information. You know, it's like the more, the better, the better we can understand these things. Um, but I don't wanna see you guys burning your joinery tools because you still need them. Um, the mortise and tenon isn't going anywhere. Um, figuratively and literally.